This is our town, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Ours is an industrious, hard-working city. But Chippewa Falls wasn't always the thriving city it is today. In the early days, the Ojibwa Indians fished and hunted along the Chippewa River. But the great strand of white pines attracted lumbermen who settled here in 1837. They built the largest sawmill in the world. Over one million feet were cut every three days. White pine, the drive, the big mill. These things were then the very heart and soul of Chippewa Falls. But the lumbermen slashed away the mighty pines and hemlocks without any thought of the future. They left the area with stumps, but no large trees, and moved on further west. They had moved on west, and they left the now open land. But the land was good land, and it was fertile land. The earth would give life to growing things if it were tended. The people to work the land and to reap its benefits did come. As the lumbermen moved on, the farmers moved in. Many of them came under the provisions of the Homestead Act. They fenced in the land. They built their homes and barns. They removed the stumps. They planted their seed. They harvested their crops. And there was power, great power, power from the rushing river. A great dam and hydroelectric plant were built. By 1891, the streets were lighted by electricity. And in 1898, electric cars ran through the streets of Chippewa Falls. The falls, however, gave way to progress. The damming of the river put the mighty falls 250 feet below the new river level. But the power was still there. Power, power to build great industries, power to turn the wheels of big mills, power to provide new jobs, new products, and a new type of city. Even before the lumbermen were completely gone, new industries were starting. Great industries, like the Chippewa Falls Woolen Mill Company, were rolling. Since 1882, this firm has been producing the famous Chippewa woolens from raw wool through through the finished garment. At the start of the progress, the grated grease wool is fed into the duster. Matted wool is opened in fluffy state to facilitate scouring and lumps of dirt, sand and other loose impurities are removed. The dusted wool is passed through scouring or washing trains which consists of three separate bowls and three squeeze rolls. Clean washed wool is either dyed in dye tubs or if left in natural color is passed through dryer machines to bins behind the burr picker. The burr picker removes burrs, chives, straw, and other vegetable matter. The fine teeth on the rotating rollers removes burrs but allow the free passage of wool fibers. In the mixing picker, the wool fibers are thoroughly mixed in the proper proportions to give a homogeneous mass of fibers. Carding wool means to disentangle it and arrange the fibers into a light, fluffy, continuous web. The machine does this by running the wool over three large cylinders which are arranged in a series. These cylinders have a fine wire clothing. Small workers and stripper cylinders, also wrapped with fine wire clothing, operate about each cylinder. As the lumps of wool are carried on the surface of the wire cloth rollers, it is straightened out and formed into a web. The web of wool is divided into many narrow strips, which form round soft ropings or ropings for the spinning machines. The spinning mule draws the roving out to a greater length twists it to form strong yarn, and finally winds it into bobbins. The yarn is rewound onto pattern bobbins or larger filling bobbins according to where it is going to be used. Pattern spools are eventually wound on a large warp beam which is placed behind the loom. In weaving, the warp yarn ends are interlaced with filling yarn to form a cloth or fabric. The looms are completely automatic and will run continuously unless a warp or filling thread breaks. The shuttle which carries the filling yarn back and forth through the warp yarns moves at a terrific rate of speed.
cloth repairing or burling is done by hand. Loose threads, knots, and other imperfections are removed. The woven material is passed through wooden rolls and brass flange plates that shrink the cloth in length and width. Controlled washing gives the cloth the proper soft wool feel. Shearing clips are protruding fibers from the surface of the cloth, and napping lifts individual fibers to give the fabric that soft, fluffy feeling. These two operations give the material a uniform surface. Decating the final process, steams cloth, which presses and sets the yarn. Kenneth Giese, the dye master, tests raw wool before the lots are used. Chippewa Woolen Mills is one of the three companies in the United States which performs every step themselves, from raw wool to the finished garment. Most of the wool comes from Wyoming, South Dakota, Montana, and the wool pool in Minneapolis. Besides testing the wool for quality, one of the dye master's important duties is developing different shades. 110 different shades have been developed here by Mr. Giese. Before any new style, pattern, or shade hits the market, it is carefully checked, planned, and discussed by the key executives of the firm. George Rorick, Jasper Berlin, and Fred Bernard check some of the newer lines. These men know wool from A to Z, and they believe in wool. Wool is the most absorbent of all fibers. It absorbs up to 30% of its weight without becoming damp. It is most wrinkle resistant, gives the greatest warmth without weight, takes dye most beautifully and permanently, and is not inflammable. In this day of so-called miracle fibers, it is fiber W that is still the most exciting fiber of all. At a modern clothing plant nearby, the fabrics are cut and sewn into beautiful high quality garments. There are 350 people employed by Chippewa Woolen Mills in their factories. The finished garments are a tribute to the quality control and pride in their work. Before lumbering was gone from Chippewa Falls, the city began being known as the shoe manufacturing town. Chippewa Shoe Company maintains its plants here. The original Chippewa's reputation for quality was gained through its manufacture of rugged logging shoes. The first step in shoemaking is sorting the selected leather and putting up the cutting job. This is being selected for the lightweight moccasin outdoor boot. The leather is then cut with a three-quarter inch double-edged steel die. Though it appears simple, this is one of the higher skilled jobs, for it involves a lot of experience to determine the proper proportion of the leather needed for certain sections of the shoe which demand either flexible or more rigid leather. When all the component parts have been cut, they are assembled and inspected. Alfred Hubb, the cutting room foreman, has been with the company for over 50 years. The parts are marked for size, style, and lot number. Skipping makes the leather thinner where it overlaps. Now the shoe is being assembled as the various parts are sewn together. The original Chippewa label is sewn onto the tongue and the boot begins to take shape. The 175 employees engaged in production turn out over 1,300 pairs of shoes per day. The quarters are joined to the vamp, and the upper leather insole is sewn in at the rate of 3,000 zigzag stitches per minute. Temporary lacing is put in as preparation for lasting. The many types of machinery used now are a far cry from those used when the plant was first starting in 1901. The last, a wooden form, is inserted in the upper. This will keep the final shoe's shape throughout the rest of the shoemaking operation. For this particular boot, a hand lasting operation will be used, though on others machine lasting is done. The advantages of hand lasting are greater flexibility and lighter weight of the product. This, however, increases the cost of the labor involved. The midsole is then sewn to the leather upper. The outsole is then laid with 150 pounds of pressure per square inch. The outsole is cemented and the steel shank is inserted prior to laying. The outsole is rough rounded to trim away excess. The Goodyear outsole is then stitched on. Though these machines do much of the work automatically, it is the skill of the operators that determines the final quality of the product. Most of these people spend years perfecting their technique at these machines. The outsoles are leveled. 
That is to say, the stitches are firmly embedded into the outsole for greater wear. Mr. Peter Limay has been with the firm for over 52 years, having come to work six months after the company began operations. He operates the automatic healing machine. The excess of the heel is trimmed away by two semicircular cutting blades on a shaft, which rotate at 7,000 revolutions per minute. The shoes now go through a process of treeing and dressing, where they are checked and carefully prepared for the oil finish, which is then sprayed on. Lacing and packing complete the processing, and the boots are ready for delivery to original Chippewa dealers throughout the country. Original Chippewa boots are readily identifiable by the labels sewn into the gusset of every pair. Peter Stenza, factory superintendent, performs a final inspection as Mr. T. A. McDonald, president, and Mr. A. C. Bookberger, assistant superintendent, perform a routine check to be sure that the uncompromisingly high standards of quality are being maintained. The completed lightweight outdoor boot is beautiful to look at and is as serviceable as it is handsome. Chippewa Falls, other shoe company, is the Mason Shoe Company. This firm was originally founded in 1904 by B. A. Mason and the business is now handled by his three sons. Today, the firm occupies two large buildings with floor space totaling 125,000 square feet. It is expected that the new office building will increase production of the staff by approximately 40%. Through its many sales representatives, all the shoes produced by this firm are sold directly to the wearer. When a person's order is sent in, it is processed quickly and efficiently. The order is zoned, the inventory and order are checked, and the salesman is credited. Ultra-modern equipment and trained personnel swiftly audit and prepare your order for actual shipment. The shipping labels for each individual pair are typed up and sent to the shipping department. From an inventory of 200,000 pairs with about 10,000 variations in style, color, size, width, shape, and pattern, the correct pair is picked out and speeded along conveyors. Additional stocks are kept at a warehouse in Stanley, Wisconsin. On the average, about 3,000 pairs are shipped out every day. Packages are all tied automatically, and mailing machines speed the postal operation. Many people believe it is easier and more convenient to buy their shoes this way. Though the first shoes turned out by the company were mostly loggers' boots, the good part of production nowadays is devoted to dress shoes. There is a new line of dress shoes every six months. Each new style takes from six to nine months of design. The greatest feature of Mason shoes is the Velvet Ease Air Cushion Inner Sole, which softens jars and shocks of walking. Mason shoes are manufactured on over 175 different machines and involve 238 processes. The counter is assembled in the shoe. Its purpose is to give full support to the heel. Machine lasting, like hand lasting, is a highly skilled and meticulous process. The box toe is inserted in the shoe, and the shoe is pulled around the last, giving it its form. Ingenious lasting machines help to pull the leather upper of the shoe smoothly and tightly over the last. All along the production line, high standards of quality are maintained through quality control and pride in workmanship. Mr. Edgar Clary, foreman of the treeing and packing department, and Mr. C.W. Kemp, plant superintendent, check the product from time to time. Supervising the several hundreds of competent men and women who produce and ship Mason shoes is an experienced team. Owen Mason, Frosty Froberg, and Ned Mason are three of the top policymakers of the company. At present, there are eight regional sales offices in the main cities of the United States, and more are being added. Every Mason representative has back of him a stock of over 200,000 fine shoes, far greater than even the largest shoe store. In addition, he draws upon huge daily production prior to anticipated demand. The fertile lands in the Chippewa Falls area have not only given rise to some of the best dairying in the nation, but have also made this section important as a grain and vegetable producing center. 
The Chippewa canneries receive peas and corn from farmers under contract. The vines bearing the peas are unloaded and dumped into the viner. They pass through a series of crushing rollers, which break open the pods, allowing the peas to fall out and down into another section. The peas themselves are not crushed by the viner because the vines and leaves act as a cushioning around the peas. The peas are brought by truck to the cannery. Before they are unloaded, samples are taken and tested on a tenderometer. The tenderometer determines the tenderness of the peas. The farmer is paid for his peas according to the tenderness of the vegetable. After foreign material is removed and the peas have passed through a size graders, they are washed and blanched. Blanching helps to seal the flavor in the peas. Paul Glazner, plant superintendent, helps maintain quality control inspecting as the peas come out of the blancher. Carload after carload of empty cans are continually received by the cannery during the packing season. Package after package of can after can is unloaded and started along its way from the railroad cars through what seems like endless numbers of small conveyors. The capacity of the plant is one quarter of a million cans a day. During World War II, the company used painted cans in turning out food for the armed forces. The cans were painted so that the location of the men in the field would not be revealed to the enemy by reflections of light against the shiny surfaces. From the inspection table, the peas go down into the filling machine where they are mixed with a solution of water, sugar, and salt for flavoring. Each of these machines turns out 225 cans per minute. The cans are sealed automatically, and the seals are checked to make sure that spoilage will not occur. The cans are loaded into huge containers by the use of these suction grippers. Many of the employees are high school and college students who find the cannery to be the ideal place for summer employment. This is because the peak of the canning season corresponds very closely to their summer vacations from school. The cans are next placed in huge pressure cookers and left there for 30 minutes to at 240 degrees. After this operation, they will be cooled, labeled, packed and stored for shipment. The first and only brewery in Chippewa Falls was built in 1867 by Jacob Leinenkugel. He was twice selected mayor of our town. In brewing beer, the barley malt is cleaned and crushed to proper fineness, and then in the mash tub, the plows and rakes mash the malted barley with clean, natural Chippewa spring water. The wort is run from the mash tub into the brew kettle and boiled. Adjunct and hops are added for flavor and desirable characteristics. The brewing is precisely timed, and the hops are removed from the wort. The wort is then cooled by running it over cooling coils. It is aerated in carefully filtered and controlled air. The third generation of the family now owns and actively operates the brewery. They employ 76 people in the brewery and 48 in the bottling house. Yeast is added to begin fermentation and the product is now known as beer. It is then stored and allowed to mature or lager. The brewmaster, Elmer Baseman, tests the beer continually. Usually the results can be predicted because at this brewery all the ingredients are carefully measured and temperatures and times are controlled. Alcohol content is checked and after filtering and carbon dioxide are added an additional aging takes place. The beer is also checked for clarity, purity and flavor. Then it is ready to be kegged, canned or bottled. The Jacob Leinenkugel Brewing Company has enjoyed continuous growth with the exception of the Prohibition era, since it was founded. The bottling plant is equipped with modern machinery, like the pasteurizer for bottled beer. Each bottle is carefully inspected, and whenever any doubt exists, the bottle is rejected. The label Leinenkugel's Chippewa Pride Beer is automatically pasted on every bottle. The continuous increase in sales reflects the favorable acceptance of this company's fine product. The bottles are dropped into cases by this automatic casing machine. This method is much faster than hand casing, and the machine has a lower breakage rate. 
The company is very progressive and adds new equipment to the plant as it is developed. Such a new development was added this year when they installed a new grain drying department. These new improvements, however, are mostly concerned with the bettering of an already outstanding product. Through its own drivers and its local area distributors, the beer is sent out throughout the Chippewa Falls and Eau Claire areas and several surrounding communities. Linen Kugels also enjoys a fine reputation for the Bach beer that is traditionally distributed in the spring. But the large mills and small industries do not present the entire business picture of this city. The retail businesses and services must be considered. The people who live and work in Chippewa Falls must be able to fill their personal needs easily. And it is these smaller businessmen that we owe our thanks for their services. People like Sidney Olison, who operates Olison's Drug Store. Olison's was established 20 years ago. Like the other firms in Chippewa Falls, the accent here, too, is upon quality. Because of the great tourist and recreational mecca that Chippewa Falls is, the camera department assumes extra importance. Olison's Drug Store has seven employees, two of which are registered pharmacists. But like any modern-day drugstore, toilet articles and cosmetics become a necessary line as prescriptions, medicinals, and chocolate ice cream sodas. Besides facial remedies, Olison's Drugstore maintains a complete livestock remedy department for the benefit of the entire agricultural area. Mr. Sidney Olison, the owner, advises a customer on the merit of several of these products. But the mainstay of any pharmacy is its prescription department. It is here that the community is truly served. Like the other drugstores in Chippewa Falls, Olison's is open seven days a week from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. Each year, over 30,000 prescriptions are filled at Olison's. The pharmacy also cooperates with the Rutledge Charities and the local hospital. The compounding of prescriptions demands complete knowledge, training, and experience. At times, one's life might depend upon how carefully a prescription is filled. Complete supplies of chemicals and drugs are always kept on hand, including serums, vaccines, and the latest antibiotics. Scientific equipment helps the pharmacist in his accuracy. This precision balance can even determine the weight of a pencil mark on a piece of paper. Yes, it's people like the Jeezys, the Lamais, the Fauxbergs, the Clarys, who make our town the fine place that it is. We've seen Chippewa Falls is an industrious, forward-thinking city, from its largest mills through to its smaller businesses. But its real future is in its children. The adults of Chippewa Falls are backing a summer playground program to help develop the children culturally, through arts and crafts, physically and socially. But perhaps the most important development lies in the fields of group living and good sportsmanship. The playground program is supervised by a staff of 13 competent people at three centers. About 1,000 children take part in that program, which is carried on for six weeks, five days a week. The city government finances the entire program. Costume festivals, like a Mexican fiesta, not only teach about other lands, but also promote international understanding. This is a Mexican game, usually played at children's parties. The piñata, a bag in this case, is usually a very fat figure. The blindfolded batter tries to hit the bag, bust it open, and scatter the treats around. Once the bag is broken, the fun begins. The kids rush in to see who can get the most candy. One of the activities that swells the heart of Chippewa with pride and admiration is the dance group, under the supervision of Mrs. Evelyn Knight. The dance recitals are complete sellouts for their entire runs. From an artistic point of view, they are equally successful, as these girls illustrate. And Lindsay, 14 years old, proves that there is beauty as well as spunk and strength in cartwheels, handsprings, flips, and we hope no flops. Citizens of Chippewa Falls have seen to it that the opportunities for filling leisure time are varied. Beautiful parks, fine recreational facilities, and excellent cultural opportunities have been established for those of all ages. There are glee clubs, choral groups, artist groups, and not forgetting nature's gift to the area, 
there is a highly active conservation group. This spirit of service to community and to one's fellow man is evident in every phase of life in Chippewa Falls. But one of the most important concerns of the community is the children. Everywhere one looks, every activity seems to be geared toward raising a healthier, happier, stable, and intelligent new generation. Children like Cheryl and Danny Roberts, who are now five and eight years old respectively, are living indications of this. Little Cheryl has been dancing since she was three years old. Their parents, like virtually all other parents in Chippewa, are striving toward making life fuller and more wholesome, not be forcing their children to do, but rather by creating an atmosphere wherein the child's desire to learn and to do develops naturally from within. This is not a new attitude in Chippewa Falls. It's a philosophy upon which the city has grown. It has built people of character, people who are physically well-developed, and people who are happy. The teachers, librarians, and recreational supervisors of their children are all highly skilled, competent, and friendly. Yes, the people are serious, but they are also alert, friendly, and warm-hearted. Charities are well-supported, but more important, plans are made and carried out before the needs of charity should arise. Our facilities include opportunities for family recreation, for we feel that children must be lived with to mature fully. This is a town that belongs to all Americans, for in it they too find many of their own hopes and aspirations for the future. Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. This is our town.